experienced a software developer, I can call myself that, uh, over 20 years doing software development, uh, so know some technology. Um, as we heard, uh, the most, the, the latest trend or hype, if you want that, of technology should be blockchain. So that we have this conversation here. Uh, I would like to briefly introduce our panelists today. So we have Jping. Jping is from a news uh, media platform called Matters, which is, let me see my, my cheat sheet. Uh, it's a decentralized um, news content platform. So uh, that's Jepin, um very senior media person. <laughs> and we have uh, Tat Lam, Linda, right? Yeah. Uh, Tat come from a organization called Shenzhen City Holdings. Is that correct? Shenzhen City or Shanghai City? Shanghai City, right. Uh, and his vision is to bring blockchain technology to a social impact project to create a more transparent and trustable environment for social impact projects. And we have um, Isaac. I don't really get used to his English name. I, I know him better for his Chinese name, uh, Mao Xianghui. Uh, he was a uh, very early, um, earliest bloggers in China. He, he organized the, the earliest bloggers conference in China and I was in one of the conferences. So actually we knew like, over a decade. Isaac is now working on a project named Music Coin. So to tokenize music and the, the effort of uh, musicians, his, uh, his, his vision is to, to build a transparent platform and uh, to create a fair pay for the work of musicians. And Rob Stone, Rob is from, uh, Rob's current business is called DataVest. The idea is to allow people to invest your own personal data, which is now being um, exploited by big companies. So Rob is trying to find another way to allow people to leverage to take, a, take advantage of their data. And we should have another panelist, uh, Peter Harris, from uh, his organization is <coughs> Resonate, sorry. <laughs> but Peter uh, could not make this, this uh, trip. So let's, yeah, give him a, a, a advantage to, let's uh, watch the video from Peter first. Hey everybody. Um, hey everybody. Um, apologies for not being able to join you in person in Hong Kong. Niemann Hao, <laughs> for those that speak Mandarin. Um, I'm Peter, I'm the founder of Resonate, and I unfortunately could not be with you this, uh, this weekend because my family is moving house. So it's been a very hectic uh, couple of weeks uh, preparing for that as well as running Resonate. So what's Resonate? It is a streaming music cooperative, uh, one of the first platform co-ops to uh, be invented. Um, it was very interesting. The, the formation of the project and the discovery about uh, five or six months in um, that there was a new movement that was growing and was centered around Trevor and Nathan's efforts at the New School in New York. So it was very exciting to attend that conference in 2015 and even more exciting to see that it is spreading to Asia now. So 
uh, very happy for that. So a few questions that Jack had that he'd like me to share with you today. Um, how does our business model differ from Spotify and iTunes and everything else? Well, there's a number of reasons. One is obviously the cooperative that everyone's a co-owner and that's of course a different ownership model that uh, I think is super important. Um, as a you know streaming service, one of the big things that we looked at was about all the complaints that were coming from artists around unfair payments in the uh, streaming landscape. And so this is, uh, this is what led to the formation of Stream to Own, which is a new model which has a much higher payout range um, than current streaming uh, services like Spotify, who pay somewhere between 0 0.004 and 0 0.06 cents uh, per stream. And so what we did was we took a look at the price of downloads, split it up over nine plays, so it starts off real cheap, but then gradually gets more expensive over time. And so this is the, the beginning of our model and um, how blockchain fits into all of this is that one of the key things I saw with the advent of systems like Ethereum was that we were finally being presented with a technology that could bake uh, fairness and transparency and all of these values right into the operating system of an organization and that was something that was apparent from the, the very beginning and I, would, I have always sought to use blockchain um, but I think that we were a few years ahead of the curve with uh, the issue of scalability now we're starting to see a lot of third generation blockchains that are uh, talking about that one of them is a partner we're working with Archain out of Seattle um, and uh, they've also got a development um, arm in, in uh, Singapore, Archain Asia. Uh, shout out to Jonathan Kochmer if you're interested in following up on that. But um, with this, uh, these new systems, um, we're finally going to be uh, reaching the ability to hit scale uh, that uh, is so important and so necessary when it comes to running real consumer applications. Um, by way of example, for those who don't know, uh, Bitcoin is about seven transactions a second, Ethereum is about 14, and you know when we're looking at what consumers are uh, used to, we're, we're in the range of Visa at 40,000 transactions a second. So this has been a huge um, part of our focus is looking at the development of the technology in different systems and how we would uh, be able to develop in parallel with, um, with them because it's really necessary to um, to, to look at this side of it uh, in order to, to do, you know, to build a service that, that can actually meet the needs of um, modern consumers and listeners and all that. So um, blockchain for co-ops, I think, is a really interesting topic because it, it uh, presents the opportunity to uh, take a look at the kinds of uh, rule books and value systems that you get with cooperatives and also, like I said, um, tried to bake those kinds of characteristics into the operating system uh, of an organization. So while there are, have been different attempts like in the, the creation of the DAO or DAO stack is a new project um, or Aragon is a, is a, a, a decentralized governance system, I, I think that you know more realistically uh, for projects to really work and, and, and be fair across the board to all parties, we really need to follow the cooperative ethos. Um, and so I'm hoping that that as, as things develop, we'll be able to see um, organizations start to using blockchain technology to run their governance models. And we're, we're seeing the early, early stages, stages of this with our chain itself, which is a cooperative, um, and their support uh, in setting up our chain Europe, um, which is uh, been put together by Ella Kegel in Berlin and with that Archain Europe is going to really focus around tools for co-ops and there may be quite a bit of support there in the future so if anybody is interested in reaching out to me about that um, I think that there's going to be a lot of uh, tools and technologies to help co-ops administer um, their affairs and having this blockchain component means that you're really able to you know provide um, rock solid records and, and security of, uh, for the, uh, um, the transactions and events that happen inside organizations and especially important when it comes to uh, more distributed types of enterprises like platform co-ops. So 
Um, still early days for all of that, but I am quite optimistic about what's coming in the future. So um, I think that kind of covers the, uh, the, the, the basics. I, again, I really wish I could be there with you. I don't want to go on too long because I know a lot of other folks have uh, what we're going to speak today. So I uh, wish I was there with you and uh, hopefully uh, I'll be there for the next one. Thanks a lot. I would like to invite our panelists to to have a brief introduction to themselves and what they do, and very particularly, uh, can I ask you guys when you introduce yourselves, can you please explain to our audience how your project could relate to those people who are not very tech technical. Who are um, who probably not know much about cutting edge technology? So, how your projects are relate how are re relevant to normal people? <laughs> well, I'm not sure. Uh, Jiping uh, insists herself as a normal person. Um, maybe I'll start with my PowerPoint. Yeah, actually, uh, just like Jeff said, I'm a media person before uh, this year, so I'm a normal person. <laughs> I always, this is always the question I want to find, uh, the, the, the answer I want to find, why blockchain matters to content industry. Content industry is, is where I, I am from. So I, I may start with uh, a small introduction of myself. Uh, sorry, I need to. Uh, yes, um, you can see, uh, j just want to give you a sense why I'm here. Uh, as a content creator myself, I used to be journalist, editors, uh, chief editor, columnist, freelance writer, and the co-founder of uh, online news media. And uh, actually my whole career is about producing quality content. Uh, and uh, to find to find a way to sustainably produce it, so it's 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 all around, all about my past 14 years. And a actually, after 14 years, my true feeling is um, all that all that is solid melts into the air. You can you, you can see the uh, media industry has conquered a big crisis in the past 20 years. Actually, a uh, full. Uh, and the crisis is, is, is very familiar with everyone. Um, uh, I, I just listed the, the four small points of, of how we describe this kind of crisis. We do not equally have free access to information. Censorship is everywhere, especially in, in Asia, in, uh, especially in mainland China. And uh, another one is misinf misinformation. It's all very important and uh, a significant situation in all, all around the world. It's easy to spread and hard to identify. And content creators and curators uh, routinely do not see fair uh, salaries for, from their work, or they cannot even get benefit from the work while uh, platforms do. Pla when I say platforms, I mean Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, WeChat, or, or all kinds of this platform. So actually, before I, uh, before this year, uh, technology is not a magic, and so actually, I have no idea what blockchain is, and uh, I have no idea of, of what crypt crypto economics is is before I met actually Isaac Mao. <laughs> yeah, he is an old friend of mine. And 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 I I I, I uh, the, the whole matters uh, the whole matters project is uh, inspired by him and his practice very much. And actually his practice as uh, such as uh, a theory of shareism and uh, the music home project he will mention uh, later uh, has kept uh, enlightened me a lot about how technology will change or how t uh, what kind of uh, in, in what in, in, in what sense technology will change in this whole thing so I began to learn it by myself uh, as a lifelong learner <laughs> so 
So I just started the Matters uh, project this year, uh, this whole crazy uh, adventure. And uh, because I think, uh, but, but before I introduce Matters, what we, we, ha what we are doing and we, what we will do, I think the two important questions for me is to understand f at first, before we know, before we try to figure out what blockchain can do, we need to know what it cannot do. So a blockchain cannot solve, actually solve the copyright issues. Blockchain cannot print money, cannot print banknotes. Blockchain may terminate the platform mo monopoly, but may bring another or other I important chaos. Blockchain has nothing to do with high quality content. It cannot generate high quality content. But uh, what can blockchain do in, in our experience? Uh, blockchain cannot solve the uh, copyright issues, but may label, verify, and uh, transparently manage copyrights on smart contracts. Uh, blockchain cannot, cannot uh, blockchain will bring a lot of maybe new chaos in the content industry. But uh, one thing is important, it can decentralize something distributed storage, uh, or it can make things that cannot be deleted completely. It's, it's so important to, to us in Chinese community. <laughs> and blockchain cannot print money, but it can make, but uh, the tokenized, the whole tokenized system uh, can be designed to encourage creative works. And the blockchain cannot generate high quality contents, but it can empower content providers to create, cooperate in a better, in a better way. So it, this is um, it, this is what I found uh, uh, during our around around one year's practice in in Matters project. Th this is a very short inter introduction of matters why uh, our our actually our mention uh, our mission is to um, build up a fair ecosystem for content creators uh, it, the, the whole mission is uh, deeply is also a deeply dr drive in my in, inside my <laughs> inside my uh, past career path as a content creator my, by myself. So our mission is to leverage blockchain technology to ensure that the content published in matters can be immutable, variable, and shareable. Uh, and I, I believe it's the key principle that every, every content creators care. So to actually to early users, we are just an application that you, you can write and share your ideas on our platform and reserve the content permanently. But behind that, we aim to use the metadata record as a framework to build a protocol. A protocol means we are not trying to uh, force the entire internet into a website or force every publisher to use matters.news. To, to reach the content. The content you see in our web website is running on the protocol behind. So we, we, we like to share all the content to different media outlets using a shared standard and a metadata format. So uh, it, it, it's, it's about all the things. Uh, we, we have already, uh, we, we will be officially launched uh, by the end of 2000 and uh, by the end of this year. And we have already have 1,500 users on our website and around 4,000 articles and 8,000 comments. So we are on, on our way. We, we, we will build all our uh, uh, content on IPFS and the Ethereum blockchain. And that's the brief thing. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Ted Lam. I'm from Shanghai City. Shanghai, Chengshu, Shanghai, Shanghai, Shanghai. Uh, a lot of people ask me why I get this name. Uh, I, will, I will explain that later because it's very complicated. I don't want to waste time on that. So we've actually been dedicated the last four to five years building digital capacities and data literacies in poor regions. I'm personally a digital anthropologist. I study how poor people engage with high tech, like how a grandma don't even have a cell phone can use blockchain to, to trade cryptos, for example, something like that, right? It's something really, really uh, extreme that, you know, but the mission is that we believe the entire problem for social 
inequality and poverty is because of asymmetries of information. Like the local people don't know what's happening in the world. So there are lots of middlemen make money or take advantage of the poor people. So that's fundamentally something that we want to solve, right? So our company is actually a social finance intermediary company. So, I mean, everybody knows that there's money there, there's social problems there. Money come all the way down to solve the social problems. So we need to know what problem happening on the ground, right? So the money can be more precise, can be more uh, uh, precisely uh, allocated to those problems, and data can come back. So basically, this is actually always the interaction between the money and the problem. But this system in the current world is super inefficient. There's around 4% to 20% of the money, no matter your donations to Red Cross or your impact investment, or any kind of sustainable investments. Four to 20% of money goes to somebody else instead of to the poor people. It will be those you know, consulting company, those fund managers, this, uh, this and that, right? Because identifying a problem in poor regions is super difficult. There's very much intransparency happening there. You're gonna pay a lot of money to collect data from those poor people to report the impact back, right? So four to 20%. So the fundamental idea that why we are working on data technology on that, like I, because it's actually about a co-op, you know, idea, right? About a co-op a conference. So I'll speak on the co-op way. So instead of you know having a middleman or the underwriting person or company like McKinsey or a fan managed company, we create a blockchain technology to cooperate to make the poor people as a co-op to take over the the, uh, the jobs of impact measurements and fund management. So basically the poor people are, are, are actually incentivized to report data to the management platform, data platform, so all the impact is transparent, all the deal flows is transparent. So basically this is fundamentally what we do. I can actually show you three cases how we do this, right? The first case is actually a collaboration between us and a bunch of NGOs in Brazil and the Brazil government um, uh, Ministry of Social Development. It's actually a project to deal with 80 million poor people in Brazil. And all of them, mo mostly of them, do not have a bank account. So basically, we are creating what we call the decentralized identification. And that means everybody have their unique ID, and they're logged in on their cell phone or a shared computer in their village center. So they get in, they actually have their crypto accounts. And their crypto accounts are actually a management of all the vouchers the government's giving them. For example, school voucher, for example, food voucher, and this and that. They can create local community currency to, 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 to trade and to exchange, right? So because of that, everybody start to gain what we call economic identities. Because they have no cash, but they have such kind of economic activity, we can start to accumulate social credits or even like other credits for these people about their behavior, about this and that, right? So basically this is the first project about how we set up the infrastructure for you know, um, um, blockchain or any kind of data technology by giving the data sovereignty back to the poor people. The second case is actually a project that we work in Myanmar. It's actually, you know, either I have my economic identity, how I can take a stake in my community. It's actually a micro social bond project. A community of say of 100 people, they can create a voting on blockchain and say we need to build a playground with 5,000 US dollars. And we want to crowdfund, for example, 20% of this 5,000 US dollars. And the rest of the world can crowdfund the rest of it. We also vote to define what is the milestones of the achievement. Like the first milestone can be the playground completed with no injury. The second one can be the uh, playground got built, uh, but uh, you know there's some sort of occupancy, right? When these two milestones is achieved, the government pay back with 20% interest or some sort of interest rate. So it's literally a social bond concept, but it's super small. So blockchain technology able to automate this whole thing through without paying any lower fee, right? The number three cases is actually what we're actually launching next, next week in China, which is actually a co-op exchange. So imagine with this you know, local village, we all have our supply chain. We all have our water, your wine, your rice, or this. We can actually start to trade our things inside the community, and every single trade is actually a blo uh, 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 block on the blockchain, right? So when the product go to the market, I'm literally able to see where, like if I'm selling a wine, I know where's my rice come from, I know where's my water come from, I know where's my you know, other things come from the community. I know who is actually growing it. So we actually also incentivize people to upload more data, what we call the thick data, to the transaction rate. And basically, you know, this is what we call the Oracle Marketplace, because every single exchange in the world is all about financial data, right? But 
the trick about blockchain is that how the real world data can start to interact with such transaction data. So this is something that we call an Oracle marketplace. That means how we upload real world data into the blockchain. So instead of just knowing Pharma A is trading far with Pharma B for rice on that price, we also know Pharma A is poor, earning 3,000 RMB per year. And Pharma B have three kids and one of them is sick. And that started to help us to not just measure the economic developments of the sites, but also understanding the social development of the sites. I will share more later on. Thank you very much. Do you use the slides? Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, actually, I didn't plan to use this. Uh, PowerPoint presentation because it's only shared within panelists. But since they suggest to use a you know, visual thing, so I will try to traverse this one to make sure everyone understands what MusicCoin is doing. Actually, like um, Peter Harris introduced, you know, the music industry is actually a rotten machine already running over 100 years. So that's the problem there, you know, very clearly. Everyone saw that, but nobody can solve it because of the establishment there. That's the, pro that's the reason we defined this project back to two years ago. We uh, all actually spend roughly two million US dollars from a failed project to learn all those, you know, uh, lessons and problems in the industry. And then we started to see What's the major problems there? You know, roughly we categorize like 10 types of issues, but I only show some of the social media responses, you know, on the industry, how it failed to pay musicians, uh, failed to pay creators, and also have a lot of uh, kind of corruptions, you know, there. Of course, uh, people would, uh, you know, pay attention like this one. What did uh, Lady Gaga earn for one million plays? Try to guess in your mind, actually, the answer is clear. It's, it's the minimum one, D. <laughs> You're right. So, I, so the problem is not only about the payment to the creators, performers, all the musicians, you know, all, all around the world, but also the industry set up a lot of rules, you know, and very perplexed, you know, like a kind of relationships. So they, all of them will take uh, a piece of pie from this uh, whole system, but eventually only 12% of them, this is data from last year, uh, flow to musicians. So you can see that the distribution of the whole industry's revenue and the income, you know, only uh, have a very small uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, thing to uh, musicians. So this is why uh, we are trying to see this allocations of uh, industry, how can it be reinvented? How can it be uh, redefined by uh, traditional like solutions, which uh, we found is very difficult um, because of uh, the piles of the organizations, you know, has been set up in the industry. It's not, it's only an abstraction of the piles, you know, it's actually across different regions, locations and also have different names and uh, titles, you know, around uh, uh, like local communities and uh, countries, geographical, you know, um, existence. So our solution, I'm not really trying to um, prompt, you know, a blockchain too much because I'm a strong skeptic, you know, of blockchain by myself. I really, really suggest everyone be cautious to adopt this technology before you really think about your problems, you know. So uh, we want to have a collaborative model instead of, uh, you know, a piled, like, um, a, a, a kind of fossil model, you know, uh, as the current industry doing. In other words, you know, so to speak, like um, uh, removing those middlemen. But we don't think that removing middlemen is realistic, you know, in the in the real world. So we are trying to set up a new model, which is using a new generated, you know, uh, technical solution uh, linked to different stakeholders, which enable them to participate in this new model, uh, which uh, the same time, uh, um, uh, like um, protect their existing benefits or incentives 
the same time, they can change their roles, so maybe change their business models, etc. Especially for musicians, you know, they don't need to deal with those organizations like pros in the industry. Instead, they can simply, you know, set up their own identity in this network and eventually share their content, share their works, you know, to the whole network and uh, and uh, marked in the uh, timeline of the whole uh, ledger. So our solution have a very unique part of the uh, of the design, you know, uh, comparing to other blockchain related stuffs. You know, for example, we have a u universal basic income protocol inside, which uh, actually, if you know blockchain, is actually mined, you know, those cryptocurrencies, and portion of them we are defined to give uh, uh, freely to musicians. So this system is quite unique, and we have run it over one and a half year, which already uh, included over 6,000 musicians all around the world because it basically is cross-border project and no boundaries. You can simply register and being verified as a musician and then you can release and then your song will be listened by other people anywhere all around. And there's another protocol called paper play protocol, which ensure your income being um, like uh, committed, being uh, transferred. We don't charge anything. So for listeners, they're free. For musicians, they get 100% of income. That's the basic uh, mechanism in, on this platform. Okay, I will try to elaborate more. Thank you. Bravo. Oh, we do, okay. I was actually hoping we wouldn't, uh, I always get distracted. <laughs> I, I think I'll just, uh, yeah, improv here. Um, but, um, so the, um, the mission of DataVest is, is really um, kind of building off of uh, your comments on, on UBI is to, to create a platform that's capable of providing a um, an alternative to UBI um, that requires no subsidies, no welfare, uh, just just res uh, uh, re recompense for value actually created by um, by individuals. And um, there was a there was a book by uh, Jerome Lanier called uh, "Who Owns the Future." I don't know if anyone's read that, um, but uh, that was back in 2013, and he predicted that. Um, that in 10 to 15 years that the data value per person would exceed the poverty threshold. And um, it's, it's pretty amazing to, to even consider if it was even a fraction of that, that this is worth, uh, this is something that, that uh, is worth experimenting and, and, and trying to build something like this. And I, I do think that in the future, uh, we'll look back and, and think about you know, the time right now where, um, where a lot of people didn't even really realize the the value of our our data that we're generating on a daily basis, and uh, that that value is only increasing right now. So it, it may not be a huge amount right now, but I, I think we're kind of reaching the the knee of the curve where the value is going to only increase uh, potentially exponentially going forward. Um, kind of when I, when I first started or when I first had had the idea. For this, I was actually reading um, Trevor's book, and uh, so I have to uh, blame him for being broke right now. <laughs> um, but I was I was thinking about um, there, there's a quote by Lewis Kelso, and, and he said that um, the the challenge that we have right now is 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 how do we give workers um, ownership over the technology that's gradually replacing them? And I started thinking about that and. Um, and then, and then, kind of um, thinking about that in the context of, of platform cooperativism, and um, I did a kind of a simple thought experiment, and I, I thought, okay, what what if um, every, say, Facebook user, but you could use any kind of internet platform as an example, what if each user had uh, a share, an equal share of that company, um, and you know, a lot of the value in, in, in Silicon Valley, I mean, uh, Valley, um, when when people go to these VC pitches, they're always talking about network effects or data network effects, um, either negative or positive. And uh, the idea behind that is that the value of the platform increases at a, at a nonlinear rate, at a quadratic rate. Um, and, 
and so you almost have this situation that if each individual user, as, as, as a new user would join, um, you actually have the value of the shares of that user increasing in value. So um, it's kind of an odd situation, but um, it's kind of a simple equation, but n squared divided by, you know, um, uh, if n is the number of users and then shares is equal to the number of users, um, that you actually do have the ability to basically print print money in a sense because um, it's kind of an odd situation. I, I came from Wall Street, or from Morgan Stanley, so on Wall Street, if you could kind of print shares and, and have them actually increase in value, that would be an ideal situation. So I, I think from a cooperative lens, um, we actually have the ability to um, benefit as more, as everybody else within the cooperative is also benefiting. So. Um, it's not it's not a economics of scarcity, but of a, a abundance. I think. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, from last year to this year, I heard about a lot of uh, blockchain related projects, and uh, to be honest, I from my point of view, most of those projects don't really need the blockchain, they don't really need the crypto graph or our decentralization. What they need is just a, a from my point of view, uh, they just need a centralized uh, relational database and that's it. Uh, but anyway, people still put the new concepts on top of their projects and uh, seduce people who don't really understand technology but uh, happen to have some money and by the way, there is a term for those people. Uh, they call, call them garlic, garlic chive. And the, the process of uh, cai, <laughs> and the process of seducing those people is called cutting, cutting chives. <laughs> so yeah, I think, but still, I believe there are some projects which uh, application of new technology is, is necessary. So I would like to. Uh, raise this question to our panelists. How do you think the necessity of blockchain in your um, project, very particularly what you have achieved, um, which cannot be done if you, you don't have blockchain but only have a relational database? Since I have the microphone, I think I'm <laughs> obligated here. Um, so for us, um, we never uh, kind of set out to, to create a cryptocurrency. Uh, it ended up being the right tool for us. Um, and the key here was we're, we're trying to figure out a way to, to give individuals a vested interest in, in not only the, the current value of their data, but also the future value. And so um, that required a, um, some form of ownership. In, in the applications or the future applications, future revenue that's produced by the data that they're generating right now. And so, um, actually a, a co-founder um, of DataVest, uh, he, he kind of specializes in direct public offerings and we were considering basically issuing shares for, in exchange for the, the contribution or investment of data. Um, but we, we thought that logistically that would be almost a, pretty much a nightmare to, to kind of issue shares of our company to uh, potentially hundreds of thousands, millions of people and a across the, the world. So it, it ended up being the, it, it is an equity proxy for us um, and it, it seems like the right tool for us. And uh, I even convinced uh, David Lee that uh, that was the case uh, last night. <laughs> Some of us got that. <laughs> I, I can talk about that. I can, I can talk about that. Um, well, I, I think I will be quite aggressively to argue that blockchain is necessary, particularly for developing regions. So blockchain is actually a fintech. Everybody knows, right? It's actually about transactions, it's about a decentralized ledger system. That means anybody's transaction with anybody can be recorded immutably, right? So basically that's the one-liner for blockchain. But why, why blockchain is so important to us? It's actually not we choose blockchain, it's actually the blockchain choose us, I think some, uh, somehow. You know, um, we actually work on projects in refugee camps. 
we collect data for refugee peoples. The data is actually in our database. We talking to, for example, NGOs or governments that, you know, should we actually transfer this personal sensitive data to your database or to other people's database? The NGOs say, I'm sorry, I don't know how to host any data, right? And please do not give to the government. The government can arrest everybody because everybody in the refugee camp technically are illegal. So such kind of data where to go, right? That actually is the triggering point about how we actually able to create a decentralized identifications. That means even the server host are actually not hosting the public key or the private key or any kind of key to get into the, da to, to the database. It's actually what we call the digital assets or digital sovereignty for those people. Like they, they own nothing. They own the tree, they own the house, they own their data. Data is actually their asset. They're only owned by them because nobody can take it from them even the governments, right? So that's one case of why, why blockchain, the 5% blockchain of this 100% like database make this actually work in developing regions for ethical problems, right? That's number, number one. The number two is really about community currency. Now actually, there are a lot of research talking about like if we donate money, say US dollars get to Africa, there are maybe 3.5 transactions in the village, the money gonna go back to the city. Money not going to stay in the village. So that's why the network idea about cryptocurrency or committed currency actually coming. Committed currency is actually not a new idea. It's happening in the 1970s. They actually started to create local community currency that are always going to stay creating liquidities in the local communities, generating economic activities without relying on US dollars or RMB. And that actually creating the, res the resilience of the local communities. And blockchain come in, you know, because everybody in Africa have a Huawei secondhand cell phone then why can't we just let them start to trade with community currency on blockchain, right? So that's the second case that I, 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 I want to talk about why blockchain work in the developing uh, region. The third thing is about the microtransactions. Like when, when I'm talking about the social bond, it's actually a big concept. Like when a US government or World Bank creating a one billion US bond, they spend so much money on lawyers to create all these mandates and all this, uh, you know, uh, dispute resolution, blah, 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 right? But how can you issue a bond with 2,000 US dollars by paying those money to those lawyers? So if we have microfinance, we have micro lending, we should have micro bonds. And I think blockchain technology started to work on that one because it literally take away the middleman, which is the lawyers, because they don't really need such complicated case-by-case -case mandates. So I, I think blockchain work on a very scalable idea, working poor people, banking and bank, I think that generated a huge amount of identical ident identifications as well as ethical values to those people. I, I, I mean, I will answer your question later, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I can, uh, you know, in my, I guess, role to throw cold water on blockchain. Um, uh, just a few questions that came up in the community, right? Uh, one is um, this uh, actually quite technical, right? So that, that there's a stipulation that blockchain actually doesn't scale at all because of the ecological sustainability issues. And then secondly, particularly with the issues with refugees that you bring up, that uh, the identity problem, right? Uh, so that people can't actually, that you can't actually positively identify uh, individuals uh, in, in the blockchain ecosystem. And then thirdly, uh, the question that I always ask uh, blockchain proponents is, uh, what does it actually do right now? Should I ask this question right now or wait for? You know, I, I, okay, I think number one, I think uh, there is a misunderstanding between blockchain and Ethereum or Bitcoins. Blockchain by itself is actually a distributed technology. It can be a private blockchain, it can be this and that, right? There's a lot of solutions that we can customize for each community to save their energies and save their computation power and so on. So when we talk about a decentralized community exchange, it's literally a private blockchain hosted by one piece of computer. And, and that's it. So you can actually customize entire chain mechanism to actually make it efficient, specialized to specific community situation, that's number one, right? Number two about the identification for refugee uh, issue is equally sensitive in centralized technology and decentralized technology. So sensitivity is not, you know, a, a problem for blockchain, it's actually a problem for everything. It's really about like how the data, like the decentralized identification number, which is the Ethereum wallet, you know, ID, relate to myself, should I use my fingerprints or my face? Like, our technology never recommend any biometric because that's something, I cannot change my face to change my identity. So it should be a triangulation of something. So there's actually 
a, a series of theory about how we develop identification in developing regions. It's actually what we call ID4D, identification for development. It's actually the, the, the second thing. It's actually a huge topic that we definitely want to work with a lot of people to sort out that, right? Number three is about the actual use. I will tell you this. In our company technology, I got 2% of blockchain. Our tokens are centralized tokens. We only use a small piece of it as a blockchain, which is only the, the transaction part of it, or even some, somewhere that we really need to use it, because it's really expensive. How many refugees do you work with right now, with so, blockchain? In the I think in total, we may have like around like 10,000 of people on right like on the system, on the system. Oh, I, I mean, often has a small piece of blockchain, uh, which is the decentralized identification part. Okay. So all of them have a small piece of it, which is the decentralized identification part, which is literally the opportunity for them to have a so-called wallet system for them to receive uh, uh, aids or vouchers. Uh, can I? So I think it's very valid, you know, to challenge the the you know the usages of blockchain or the validity of um, using this technology. I think it's a technology nobody doubted, but uh, comparing to the historical you know things, uh, I I really doubt that blockchain has uh, you know the hyped value you know like we have seen in the market uh, is mostly going towards to looting you know money you know from the market by using ICOs, et cetera. But I still think that blockchain has its uh, genuine value, you know, in uh, defining um, a system to be used to solve some type of issues, especially in a horizontal way, which I, I, I try to use uh, five maybe um, dimensions to check, you know, whether a project, you know, using blockchain is, um, is like a, like an innovative way or not. You know, the first thing, I think the index, or which is, um, can be a, you know, factor, which is, is it faster? Which we compare, by using Music Coin's uh, example, you know, we do increase the payment from uh, industry to musicians, roughly from uh, nine months of payment cycle to two, second, two minutes. So I, I believe this is going to be faster. That's why I use blockchain to solve this part of the issue. The second is, the second factor is, is it f cheaper, right? I, I also use this uh, as an example, talking to the industry, uh, my industry, I said, you know, the music industry take a lot of paperwork, still using papers to, uh, you know, transfer data from different organizations because they need to, reconcile those copyright, you know, relationships, et cetera, and uh, eventually uh, cost a lot of money you know, to uh, do these administration jobs. So definitely blockchain, you know, realize some part of that, you know, I cannot say full of that. The third is, you know, uh, did this technology really democratize, you know, the participation of the whole system? and. The amazingly that there is um, like uh, 8 million musicians, indie musicians all around the world, but only like uh, half a million of them, you know, in the traditional industry, they don't want to deal with the traditional industry because they, they, they don't trust the industry. So the industry actually only include less than 12%, uh, 15% of the musicians all around the world. And, and I think that blockchain give a chance that people can have a very easy entry to step into this industry, which enrolling this financial system. Uh, of course, uh, there are a lot of technical issues we need to solve, like uh, proof of uh, work, you know, the consensus itself has a huge problem, you know, which causes a lot of um, ecological issue, um, like uh, burning energies, of course. Um, but I think that the, the, the technology itself, like Earth, we are trying to engage um, uh, a new kind of consensus, we call proof of share rhythm, which actually using not only machine power, but also trying to have the verification layer from uh, 
um, validated, you know, musicians, etc., or verified musicians. Eventually, there could be millions of them become a, a middle tier that can verify those blocks, uh, not just using computing power, because in computing power, uh, there are also a kind of a problem, like today's Bitcoin, only 2% of the Bitcoin wallets hold like 80% of Bitcoin's uh, value there. No, it's, it's not like uh, democratize anything. Yeah, it's basically centralized money and uh, value. And so this is the problem. So I think this, this dimension is very much my uh, concern, you know, whether uh, we should apply blockchain technology. The, the last one is the side effects, you know. Also, I mentioned the energy cost of uh, blockchain, you know, especially those uh, cryptocurrency uh, bonded stuffs. But for, as we can see, you know, like social media, we promoted back to 10 years ago. You know, we, we strongly believe social media can democratize everything and make uh, media, you know, be accessible and be, um, uh, also be um, shareable, you know, to everyone. But uh, eventually we found the side effects, you know, is quite enormous, like the fake news, you know, problem, right? Because e information is too much easy to spread over before correcting itself. So the side effect of blockchain, I see maybe there are a, lot, a bunch of them, but as a technical solution is, you know, by myself, you know, I'm not purely, know, technical solution is. I don't believe technology can solve everything, but still, we can solve technology itself, you know, the problem of uh, technology itself, because uh, the blockchain, uh, the proof of, of uh, work, you know, and proof of sh uh, stake, also proof of sharism we are developing. You know, I think eventually we are trying to find a consensus model and trust model. Yeah, so if we can really have some advancement in this area, the side effects uh, can be very much eclipsed. So that's why we chose blockchain rather than the traditional technology, which is not for looting money. We didn't go ICO. We simply, you know, use blockchain to serve musicians and center around the musicians to try to solve the problem in the industry. In short, in short, I think besides all the token transac uh, transaction or or footprint of copyright things, one simple reason that our company or our my dream need a blockchain or maybe to in a more correct way in, uh, we need a distributed technology is that we need our content to be permanently reserved and uh, have free access of information and uh, no one can block it. So it's, it's quite simple. <laughs> and that's, that's quite strong. Uh, recently, a few months ago, uh, one student in Peking University uh, made a post, uh, protest something, but, and then and, and up to the government came to the university and the university came to the student, bring her mother to the student, ask her to delete the post, and she did. And interesting thing, after that, he, his classmate posted the, 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 the article to a uh, bit, Bitcoin uh, transaction. So it's now uh, on blockchain, it's now public, it's now undeletable, anyone, anyone could, could see that. I would say that's very strong reason to have this technology. <laughs> well, um, from my observation, there is um, a uh, big gap between those technicians. Oh, you, don't, you don't admit that, but still you, you are using the technology. And uh, the majority uh, people in the society with, who are um, feeling that cutting edge technology is harder and harder to, to understand. Like, we talk about blockchain. It's not like uh, uh, building a website or building a, a WeChat media app, right? If you're building a website, everyone can understand. You go, to the, you go to the website, you can see content there. But with blockchain, we have more like misunderstanding, more um, 
uncertain, unclear stuff here. So I would like to ask from your point of view, um, what's your suggestion to, to co-ops, to people doing social work? Uh, what's your suggestion to, to those people? How, do they, how should they consider uh, cutting edge technology like, for example, blockchain? How, what should they do and what should they prepare for those technologies? Well, I think um, I think there needs to be an incentive to, to join any kind of movement, and so we we design DataVest to be as simple as possible. So um, there's no kind of ambiguity, at least on the the kind of end user side. So we um, the app will basically show you a, a U.S. dollar value that you can liquidate your tokens at any time, and that would be deposited directly into your bank account. So um, I, I think it, that's been I think the biggest holdup for a lot of cryptocurrency startups is that they, they haven't been able to get broad broad adoption. And so, um, but as, as far as kind of why we, do, just because I never kind of answered your question, but um, as far as um, why we used uh, a token and particularly why we went with Ethereum was, was basically the, idea that you can program the money, you can create smart contracts to basically serve a, a, a specific purpose. And uh, for us, it was that the only way you can gain access to this token or the, the primary market, uh, new issuance of the token can only go directly to individuals. So it's, it's almost like we all have a kind of a direct line to the Federal Reserve and, um, and that um, the, the value of the token is directly supported by the revenue of the platform. And so um, I think it was, it was the smart contracts that were really compelling for, for why we ended up kind of embracing tokens. Um, sorry to go on a tangent there. Yeah, I, re I really strongly suggest that uh, for coop-like type of projects not using blockchain so recklessly, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that blockchain needs a lot of efforts for your team, you know, to to define, you know, and design the system, et cetera. The, the best way to start is trying to have a problem definition. You need a framework for your problem first, instead of, uh, you know, chasing the, the, the hub of, uh, of a technology. That's, that's really not reasonable because uh, for many projects, you know, they came to me to ask, you know, whether should I use Ethereum to issue ICO, et cetera, so I can tokenize everything. I see, think about that. Every token on uh, Ethereum actually costs you a lot of money, now $9 maybe now for a transaction. If you, if you want a macro transaction of your, uh, you know, kind of uh, communi uh, the, the, the value exchange in your system, you cannot afford that kind of uh, price, basically. So you need back to database solution you, to find what's your problem, what's your, you know, stakeholders in it, what type of... Uh, you know, uh, solutions you offer them, you know, to make them feel is more efficiency, is, uh, is better services, et cetera, and try to remove those uh, traditional barriers. So for blockchain, I think eventually it will become a, a stack, you know, we call technical stack, you know, full stack or whatever. You know, so it will become part of the stack. The industry will solve a lot of problems using blockchain, I believe. Uh, the transaction fee will be lower be from uh, Africa to like to China or vice versa. So this all can be done, you know, by the industry. You don't need to go to re, you know, set up or reinvent uh, a, a new wheel. This is definitely not necessary. That's my uh, suggestion to Coop. Well, I think there is two things, right? The first thing is about the UI UX, about user experience, like how people are actually able to interact and argue with the application that they're using. The other one is what is the mechanism behind that, right? I'm not sure anybody knows the mechanism of Alipay or WeChat Pay, but we're using it every day. It's a really, really complicated mechanism behind that. And we never know what's the mechanism behind that. Maybe just Jet Ma just steal our money. I don't know. Or Tencent just steal our money when we are using that. But it's a centralized system that a company owns all the money that we pay to them that I suppose to trust them because they're just a big company, right? And that's it. So I, I, I think at the end of the day, the whole 
trust issue is the fundamental turning point about if we want to choose centralized technology or decentralized technology. Once there is suddenly this kind of dramatic mindset change in society that I don't want to trust anybody, I just want to trust a trustless environment, and that will actually be the trigger point. So it's not really about like the entire crypto payment system can be as easy as a WeChat Pay. It's just a wallet design mechanism. It's, it's not really that complicated. Something like a two months, you know, like a million Hong Kong dollars kind of uh, development cost. You can develop something like a WeChat Pay on crypto. But, you know, uh, so, uh, so, so, so I think at, uh, at the end of the day, you know, it, it, it's really about uh, if this is a co-op that, you know, uh, if you really would like to create a solution, I want to call it a data solution. It's actually not a centralized not or, or decentralized. It's actually literally a data solution. Uh, I think there is going to be a process to explore what kind of data is centralized, what kind of data is decentralized. It can be the case that 100% data is de uh, uh, decentralized. So it should be really case by case. So you know, like the, uh, the, 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 the co-op uh, exchange that we're actually developing in Guizhou in, in China is literally that so different from a crypto broker exchange because we totally redesigned the entire on-chain, off-chain kind of data distributions. Because there's actually ways, there are actually needs from local that some sort of data need to be public and some sort of data need to be private. Because for example, like a stock market, you don't want to know who sell you the stock, right? Like if I trade a stock on a stock market platform, I never know who sell that to me. But on a local co-op exchange, you might want to know the transaction between A and B. So it's totally different. So I would say it's actually gonna be case by case. And, and, and definitely, you know, if you feel interested about like building a co-op uh, data or blockchain centralized, decentralized database solution, I mean, we can actually talk more for specific cases. I can use myself as an example because yeah, I, I have no technique background. But I think uh, one, uh, the first thing is never reject uh, buzzword, and because maybe the buzzword is important. And the second is uh, maybe it, it's important to be a lifelong learner, uh, it, which means you, you you need to learn the knowledge you you are not familiar with. But the second, the, the third one is, which is most important, never forget where you started. I mean, uh, if technology is, not, is the answer, but what is, what is your question? If your question needs a hammer, you just use a hammer. If your question needs a block, blockchain, you just use blockchain. It's quite simple. Thank you. Uh, I think we still have uh, five minutes to, for a couple of questions. And, Yes, I, I, I saw your hand right. I just want to say there are fans of you, fans of blockchain and how the blockchain saved the world. So uh, really, the, the, the blockchain is exactly what you described. It's a case-by-case -case usage. Can I ask you guys to, to, uh, to uh, take... I'm a fan. <laughs> Fan. Let's take a picture of you guys with the, how the blockchain saved the world and especially on cooperative chains because this is all these presentations this morning were fantastic about how blockchain in its immutability and in, in its uh, distributed nature will, um, uh, will facilitate all of this. So I, it's, no, it's just a statement of thanks for bringing this to the world. We're going to, uh, the blockchain will save the world, uh, not in every case, not in every case, but in, in certainly the things that are needed. Thank you so much. I ask a very quick question to Rob. Uh, you talk about this uh, uh, U, uh, universal, uh, as, oh, you know, basic income, okay, U, UBI, or so, uh, database may be part of it, but universal is universal. Sounds like you, I think you figured out the basic uh, principles for the American, okay, underclass within America. But like in Asia, we probably have more Facebook users than in, in the U.S. But how about international transactions for uh, you know for Asian people to use data vests and then get uh, uh, you know Facebook pay them uh, across national boundaries, and, and those are legal systems. The idea behind DataVest was that anyone with a cell phone anywhere in the world um, should be able to monetize the value of their personal data immediately. So that's a good amount of the world. Um, obviously, not everybody has a, 
a cell phone, a cell phone but I think there's like, I heard a statistic that there's like more uh, cell phones and toothbrushes in the world, or so. So it, it's not quite universal, but it's um, it's close. And um, I I get this question a lot about um, kind of the data value. What, what's the difference in data value when you're looking at like a developed country or a, a developing country or frontier market? And um, I think it depends on the the application. And um, one interesting, I, I came from the investment world and. Um, a lot of hedge funds, I don't know if, if you've heard about like alt, alt traders, alternative traders, but they're basically trading on our transaction data and sentiment data that they, they are able to kind of um, harvest from Twitter or uh, they buy tra uh, kind of aggregated anonymized transaction data from, from companies like Yodley. And so um, it's kind of crazy when you think about it that, that our purchases, our transaction data that we make on a, a daily basis uh, is basically making some of the wealthiest people in the world even even wealthier and so um, I think um, I think it so so in that situation any, anywhere there's basically information asymmetry so where there's a, a lack of knowledge on prices and and that type of thing um, that you could have uh, somebody some in some remote village in Argentina that that somebody is able to um, you know, scan a, a receipt and and um, be compensated. Um, you know, in, in our case, with with uh, monetary value, um, that their their data value is actually greater than um, somebody in the United States, some billionaire that uh, we're able to get his transaction data because there's not very many kind of trends that you can um, you can pick up on from. Uh, a billionaire. There's just not too many of them, and so it depends on the context. And I, I think we're all we, we get wrapped up in this kind of a advertising paradigm. And but there's so many other valuable types of data. I mean, it, it could be biometric data. Um, all of these, um, even even kind of citizen scientist uh, projects where you're, you're kind of tapping into the the collective knowledge of of individuals across the world. And so I, I think there's a way to, um, for, for really anyone to, to benefit and that everybody's kind of perspective is valuable. And, um, and that's really what I, how I look at it. it it's, data is just information. And, um, and by sharing it, um, it we're in a unique, I think, time in, in history, really, where, where everybody, you know, I, I, it's, I used to be involved with microfinance. It was how, how do you get capital to uh, where it could be most productive and um, have the biggest impact? And um, I, you know, it's here. Here's a, a type of data that that really everybody has. Everybody's kind of sitting on this this gold mine. They don't even know it. And um, so I think um, time's up. <laughs> <laughs> I got I got the cue. Yeah, time's up. Uh, so, yeah, very thank you to our panelists. Um, thank you to Jack yeah, to have the stage.